In this video, I want to show you how I use the group bootloader and the EFI BIOS of my Proxmox server in order to upgrade Proxmox from version 6 to version 7 and how I went back in just a minute. This video is all Linux command line. Proxmox is just a Debian Linux that runs additional software such as LXC, KVM, QM and the like. What I'm showing you today is how to pivot from one Linux installation to another by using a temporary Linux installation and shrinking the size of the original file system. Here is the volume layout of my Proxmox server system, which is actually a PC which is located in a closet downstairs in the basement. There is a root volume with Proxmox 6 in it and a swap volume. I will turn that little swap volume into a bootable Linux volume boot into it with group, shrink the original file system and volume, then add a second root volume, copy the first volume onto it, then I will instruct the BIOS to EFI boot from the second volume and I will then run the Proxmox upgrade there. After the upgrade I figured out that some things are not working as expected and as I have kept the original volume I will revert the system back to version 6 using group in less than a minute. And the best? I will do all this remotely on a real headless system. Even though I will reboot the server three or four times from different volumes, I will not enter the BIOS a single time. I have no screen or keyboard attached to that system. I'll do everything from Linux over SSH. Hooray for command line! When you have a server, and you need to upgrade it, then you want to take care of a couple of things. If you are the only user of the server and of the services that it provides, then you don't really care if things go wrong. After all, you are the only person that is affected. On the other side, if there are other people using that server, then you want to take two basic things into consideration. One is downtime. In other words, the time that the services will be offline while you do the upgrade. And the other one is the way back, the plan B if things go wrong. Today we will not talk too much about downtime. With Proxmox you could have a second server or even better a cluster of three or more nodes and migrate the containers and VMs over to another node before you do the upgrade in order to minimize downtime. I really want to focus on the plan B scenario today. Oh, and just want to add one thing at this point. I will be typing a lot of commands in the command line in this video, but please do not focus too much on those commands. I will provide a written blog version of all this on my blog on www.onemark50.com. So if you want to go through this in detail later or copy paste commands, then you can do it from there. The link to my blog is in the description of the video. Here's the LVM disk layout of my system again. This is actually what Proxmox installs as a default if you only have one disk. It's got a fast SSD that has three partitions. One for non-EFI boot, that's the old school master boot record or MBR boot for 32-bit systems. One for the 64-bit EFI boot and one with the real data on it. We will only look into UFI, UEFI today. I think MBR is gone, thankfully. This third partition is the only disk in the volume group called PVE that has basically the following volumes and pools on it. There is my Linux root volume, there is a small swap volume and then there is a thin provision pool called data that in turn contains all the volumes of the containers and VMs that I'm running on that system. The root volume is roughly 100 gigabytes in size. However, once I cleaned it up, that means once I removed all the downloads, ISO images, etc. from it, it turned out that it really only contained 4 to 5 gigabytes of real Linux system data. And that actually led me to this crazy idea to use that Linux swap volume here as a kind of pivot installation. We'll see in a minute what I mean by that. Before I started it, of course, I stopped all containers and VMs running on that Proxmox node. I should also have stopped and disabled a couple of services, but more on this later. Now let's see how we can turn a swap volume into a bootable Linux.
A swap volume or partition can be switched on or off using the swap on and swap off command in Linux. Swap on V shows the currently used volumes and swap off switches them off. The system is now not using them anymore. I can now just convert it into a normal Linux ext4 file system using the mke2fs command. That creates an ext2, 3 or 4 file system inside the volume. I can now mount this new empty file system using the mount command. Just need to create a directory somewhere and then I can mount it there. So my plan is to boot from this. Therefore, I need a Linux on it. What I want to do is just take a copy of the currently running Linux system and then boot from that copy by modifying the settings for group. In order to take a copy, I'm just using the rsync command. This copies over all the files, directories, links and so on from one volume to another. Just, if we do that, we need to exclude a couple of things. The so-called pseudo file systems. Those are file systems that only exist during runtime and are not physically present on the disk, such as sys, proc, run and a couple of others. I got some errors during the copy process. Basically, I don't care too much because I will only use this volume temporarily. Nevertheless, I figured out that the files which I couldn't copy were related to LXC. So I stopped all LXC related services and launched the rsync again. I should have taken the firewall down as well because that had some files in use as well. On that note, taking a good copy of a running system is not that trivial. Basically, you need to handle two things here. Files that are locked by processes and pseudo file systems that are mounted by processes. You can see the running processes by typing systemctl status and you can list open files by using the lsof command. In order to make this copy as good as possible, I should have stopped all services on the machine first. But again, I'm not planning to run proxmox from that volume. I just need it temporarily. Cool. So now I have a kind of OK copy, which I'm quite confident that I can boot from. But how can I tell the BIOS to actually boot from that former swap volume and not from the PVE root volume? Let's have a look at how UEFI BIOS is boot Linux. The EFI BIOS would first check the disks for an EFI partition. That's actually a rather small partition, typically 100 or 200 megabytes in size that contains a FAT16 file system, the old MS-DOS style file system, right? Inside that file system, we have a folder called EFI. Inside that folder, typically you have subdirectories for each operating system or Linux distribution or bootloader manager that is installed on the system. So you might have Windows, Ubuntu, Debian, Proxmox, Clover, Apple and so on. And in each of these subdirectories, there are x64.efi binaries, which the BIOS then executes. You can do that from an EFI shell as well. Those binaries then load necessary drivers in order to be able to access an NTFS or HPFS plus or ext4 file system, depending on the OS, and then try to boot the OS from that volume. But which one should it boot? Apple, Ubuntu or Windows? In the BIOS, typically, you can choose one to be the default bootloader. We will do this from Linux without being in front of the machine and hitting Dell or F2 or whatever at boot time. Here is how. Under a Linux that has been booted using EFI, the EFI boot partition is mounted in slash boot slash EFI. In my case, that points to slash dev slash sdb2. Here in the EFI subdirectory, we can find the binaries which the UEFI BIOS will call in order to boot the system. That could be a Windows boot manager or Clover, or in my case, its group. Let me take a copy of it into a separate subdirectory. Now we use the EFI boot MGR command to visualize the BIOS boot entries. And we can also use it to add a new entry and to change the boot order. In my case, I add the copy of the group x64.efi, which I have just taken, as a new entry, which I label PVE6. My boot disk is slash dev slash sdb and the EFI partition is partition number 2. By default, the newly added entry boots first, but I just want to keep that as a fallback solution and actually modify the original one 
which should then point to the former swap partition. I do this by launching the EFI boot MGR with the dash O option. One reason why you can find so many reports on the internet of Linux installation going foobar after they have been moved from one disk or system to another is that the location of the partition where group will look for the next step in the boot process is actually stored inside that group x64.efi file. The next step in fact for the group bootloader would be to load the config file that tells it which menu options to show. That's the boot manager portion of group. From there it would then load the initial RAM disks where it can actually boot a basic Linux from. In order to change that entry or rather to make group x64.efi point to another volume, we need to use the program group-install. Unfortunately, group-install needs to be ran from the volume that you want to boot to. In Linux, we can use a little trick for that. We can actually change the root of the running installation by doing a chroot. But before we can chroot, we need to mount those pseudo file systems that I have been talking about. At least we need def, proc, sys and run. We can mount these as so-called bind mounts in the new root with a dash capital B option and actually use the ones from the real system. Now I can chroot. I'm now in the new root in a new Linux and can now install another version of the group loader onto the EFI partition. Just need to mount the EFI partition inside the chroot cage before I can do that. As I want to make sure that group gets installed as EFI loader, I specify the target equals x86 underscore 64 dash EFI option here. Now I have taken care of the first two steps. I have a BIOS entry that loads the right boot manager and that boot manager points to the right volume. Now we need to look after the third step in the boot process. That's the group config files and those initramfs images here. That is done by launching update-group. So again, we need to do both group-install and update-group. Once group has mounted one of the initramfs images and loaded the kernel from there, it will then pivot the root to the volume that is specified in the config file and launch the slash sbin slash init process there. That init or systemd process will then do stuff like start services, mount the file systems and so on. So before we reboot we also need to make sure that the last fourth and last step after the boot process is ok. That's actually the slash etc slash fs tab file which tells the new init process which file system it needs to mount. We also need that to point to the new locations. So to sum up. There are five locations or pointers that you need to change in order to EFI boot to a new partition or volume. The BIOS entry, the group EFI bootloader, then the group boot manager config files, the init ramfs images and last but not least the fs tab file. Cool. Now we should be all set to reboot the system into the new Linux on the former swap partition. Let's reboot. At this point you might wonder why I did not simply boot from a Linux CD like Knopix or the like. There's actually four reasons for that. First, this machine has a quite complex network configuration with tagged VLANs. If I booted from a CD then I would have had to spend a lot of time to get network connectivity back. Second, I had to ch root in order to reinstall group. Doing a chroot is quite simple if the chroot Linux is similar or identical to the base Linux that you are running, but can be a real challenge if the versions of glibc or libc etc are different. So using the same Linux makes this much easier. Third, as Proxmox installs everything into LVM volumes by default, I was sure that if I used the same Linux for emergency boot then I would have all the volumes readily mounted. But the decisive argument was the fourth reason. My Proxmox server is headless. That means there is no screen or keyboard. Plus it's in the basement, somewhere between the ironing board and the washing machine. I would therefore have had to connect a screen and keyboard first and stand in front of the server. Not very nice. And guys, even though I'm showing everything with LVM, it would work exactly the same way with disk partitions. 
The system has now rebooted into the new volume which I can actually verify by typing mount without any arguments and here I see that the swap volume is my current root. The next thing that I want to do is take an offline copy of the original Linux. The copy which I had made was just good enough to boot from it. It is not consistent in order to run Proxmox. So what I do is that I mount the old Proxmox 6 in slash mnt slash pve root and rsync the content into a subdirectory on a second disk. I do not need to exclude the pseudo file systems because they are not mounted as that Linux system is not running. Why do I take a copy at all? Because the next step is going to be risky. I will now shrink the file system inside the original volume and shrink then shrink the volume itself. I have shrinked the file system to 40 GB and I'm adding a bit of safety margin to the volume by shrinking it to 41 GB. Just mounting it quickly in order to have a quick check if everything looks ok. So far, so good. Now I have the free space to create a second volume which I call root2. I do this with lvcreate. The name is root2, the size is 41 GB and the volume group I created in is PVE. If I check with LVS, then I can see both logical volumes. The O here just indicates that the original root is open. So let me unmount it and here we go, the O goes away. Now I do the same like I did with a swap partition in the beginning. Create a file system with mke2fs, mount it, rsync the files from the original root over, take a copy of the EFI bootloader, label the original one swap and create an EFI boot entry for it. Change the boot order, chroot into the new volume, group install, update group and modify slash etc slash fstab. Unmount proxys run and reboot. At this point I have completed all preparation steps and I can now run the Proxmox upgrade in this new partition. Proxmox comes with a program called PVE627 that does a lot of checks if your environment is ready for the upgrade. All I have to do then is apt update, apt dist upgrade, replace all occurrences of Buster with Bullseye in the apt sources and do the dist upgrade again. Reboot. Let me check the Proxmox interface and yes, here it shows that I am now on version 7. I told you in the beginning that I had to revert back, but why? The reason is that one of the machines that I'm running on this Proxmox actually has the GPU pass-through and that pass-through did not work as expected in Proxmox 7 at the time. If you search on the internet then you'll find a lot of info about things working on some kernel versions and not on others. So I decided that I would not pursue this for the time being but rather revert back to version 6. And this is where the beauty of all this happens. I have spent a lot of time preparing this upgrade and the plan B, the fallback plan and so on. But as I have done this before, it now only takes me a minute to revert back. All I have to do is change the boot order in the EFI BIOS with EFI boot MGR and reboot the machine. Bam, I'm back on 6. And as I now have the second volume ready, I can retry this as a, at a later point without the stress of going through all this. I just have to change the boot order back in order to check back if things have been fixed in Proxmox 7 or rather the underlying kernel. Last step of course, I should now turn the swap volume back into being swap and also fix the fstab files. This can be done using the mkswap command which will override the ext4 file system on the volume. Cool, that's all I wanted to show you guys today. Please do leave me a comment on YouTube if you liked this episode and if it was useful for you. A like on YouTube is always appreciated of course. Having said that, many many thanks for watching. Stay safe, stay healthy, bye for now.